So I'm going to give a talk on configuration. Oh, there's screens all over the place. It's kind of cool. Um, past, present, future. And of course, one of my co-presenters, listed co-presenters, said, hey, let's give this talk. And we said, we said OK. And then, oh, I can't travel, so you have to give a talk. OK. But um, so this is an effort of a few folks, and I'm kind of representing some of their work. But yeah, we want to talk about firmware configuration today, sort of you know, have a dialogue, give a few examples, some thoughts, and solicit some feedback. And so the advantage of being the last day is you can watch the arc of conversation of the first few days. So the UEFI versus UFI. Um, so I said, wow, I'm going to find a canonical reference here. Because I remember this Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Like, <laughs> if, you guys, if you guys saw it, let's see if you can watch it here, if, if this works. And if not, it's very non-compelling uh, demo here. Um, you must have been strengthened, Dan, eh? last night in my forte. Right, right, listen up. This is called a unified, extensible firmware interface. Right along with me. <laughs> so I thought, man, I, I have a great memory. This is going to solve it. But he didn't say UEFI. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I screwed it. Uh, I, uh, I, um, that was no good. But I said, okay. Can we somehow bracket this discussion another way? So in 2007, I went to Black Hat. Um, John Eastman sort of started looking at, at, at the firmware space, BIOS, and the other firmware interface that most of us call ACPI. Um, it kind of seems logical. So let's see. This guy standard line graphics cards um, can be reflashed. Network cards also typically come with option ROMs these days that implement PXE. And PXE is quite nice. Um, PXE is the network booting, essentially. And so ultimately, we've got a, a networking stack already on the off. This could be subverted in a few ways, though. Um, we can apply standard um, anti uh, standard malware um, code obfuscation techniques to the ROM. 10 here, start in a minute for. Uh, in the option ROM, this is um, typically pretty suspicious. The detection process could be subverted in a few ways, though. Um, we can apply standard um, anti uh, standard malware um, code obfuscation techniques to the ROM. And also, as I'll talk about later, we can even um, prevent the, the uh, operator converting the Windows kernel or the, the operating system kernel itself. This is an uh, abstraction of an uh, ACPI implementation. Okay, <laughs> that's what I wanted. All right. You can tell. My preparation wasn't so good. I admit it, 10. He's not saying it. But he said acne. <laughs> so I guess my uh, humble question to the crowd is if, if, if Microsoft has us doing UFI, just, just lean in and you're doing acne too? Okay. So that's, that's my contribution to the time. Yeah. So I spent a long time at Intel sitting next to you and Mike Kinney and Mike Grothman and all those guys. And you know, before it was UEFI, it was UEFI. Now I'm at a new company where they all say UFI, and I'm telling them, no, it's wrong. You is silent. You see it all. I heard from the government guy, UE is U with the numlaut, so it should be Uffy. <laughs> so, so I'm out. I'm out. This is, this is my, my contribution to it. Um, and I need, I need you guys to laugh and engage because the rest of the presentation is not as. <laughs> So John Heisman, yep, and uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, and um, I had a, someone at Intel said, "Oh, ACPI is so complicated that the security researchers never get there." John Heisman, Luke DeFloyd, so that security by obscurity is never a good business strategy. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna breeze through this. So the quote speaker bios. This was my last minute ad. Um, Again, I'm at Intel, been doing this since late 90s, and I um, wanted to acknowledge some of the co-contributors, Gahan and Christine, and so since they couldn't be here, at least show their pictures and have it on, memorialized on the internet. But given my time budget here, I think I want to get into the bulk of it. So let's see, already seven minutes in. 
So yeah, what we're going to talk about today is talk about kind of the evolution of configuration, some present practices, um, and the, use some open source examples, and then some maybe thoughts about evolution. So let's see here. Um, so you know, configuration. If you think about a workflow of a BIOS engineer, most people consume oh host firmware. Excuse me, firmware. Most people consume firmware. A rarefied subset, maybe 5,000 in the world, create firmware. Um, and then in between are quite a few people that configure firmware, whether it's developer workflows or end users. So configuration is actually a pretty important um, aspect of working with uh, with host firmware. So you know some of the configuration stuff is codified by the specification: boot flow control, your boot options, your line code, because you have to have a contract between the operating system and the firmware and, and some things that are under the purview of the spec for configuration, such that you can have the OSs written distinctly from the firmware vendors, have a standard for interoperability between installers. And then there are things that are more scoped at the platform level, configuration. And in the EFI world, we have HII, which is in the um, EFI uh, specification that really lends itself to that. You know, we use, this is how you know, option ROMs typically can export configuration. You can have a device manager where they publish those forms and pages. It's pretty awesome stuff. It's been doing well for the last few years. Um, and again, variables for the, uh, for the boot flow process and allow for, again, different topologies, you know, trust anchors, like Unify Secure Boot or Boot Variables. There's some bespoke ones for things like vendors may do overclocking. And that's where, again, HI comes into play for the configuration between IHPs, the platform can export its classical setup page, and then we have variables. Um, HI is defined in a way that you can do operation upon it in the pre-OS, or things, things like HI export, even have a quote, you know, forms browser um, in the post OS. So everyone here is pretty familiar with HI, know it and love it. So just going to touch here, um, so from the team wanted to some sort of highlight some um, present practices and kind of begin with some non-recommended practices um, and then some um, runtime usages and then what tooling is out there. So one thing, non-recommended practice is callbacks. So if you have a callback running native code in the pre-OS, and then you want to do that export into the operating system. There's nothing to call back into. So you know, avoiding um, callbacks associated with forms is a non-recommended um, practice. So SHI is great, but the world kind of has a large constellation of um, configuration surfaces into the platform. So we have sort of out-of-band interfaces or optionally in-band Redfish protocols in the EFI spec. You have things like the DMTF, um, Redfish, these HTTP schemas. And then you have certain tools that have been built upon the UEFI standard and then some properties of implementation. This thing called, uh, this is a mouthful, uh, UEFI Foundational Automation Framework. I think the precursor name of it was something like an XML CLI. But it was another way to export configuration and having a tool that operates upon um, from the platform construction and HII uh, elements. Um, there's an effort in the open we call uh, USF, where we were looking at some aspects of the stack, some different approaches on how to part repartition the code, do things like payloads, but also could we normalize what that configuration representation is. Um, and so that's where we're looking at um, source embodiments like YAML. Um, you heard yesterday from Andre, um, FTT, that's a, um, a configuration mechanism and in fact some of the uh, USF work on payloads is actually looking at FTT also. So that's sort of merging on the scene. Each vendor has its own magic, right? A lot of folks have um, different ways to encode configuration in the platform, silicon specific. A lot of the boot ROMs say we encode configuration information if it's boot from NAND into the NAND or 
magic data structures in their spine or Intel has a specific one um, called uh, UPD. So again, this slide's really exemplifying the fact that there's a large open space of variability here. And then uh, as a, when I was chatting up the abstract, uh, I think Sean Brogan reminded me there's something called DFCI. And so it's omission on my initial cut at this wasn't a commentary on what I think of the tech. I think it's cool. I just was ingesting other people's slides and forgot to. So uh, DFCI has some pretty interesting approach to this configuration problem also. So really kind of setting the stage on a context that I think there are a lot of, um, not making value statements on any of them really here, but just observing the fact that there's a, a rich set of uh, technologies going after this problem space. And how you do it, right? So Redfish, what's that user visible representation? JSON, there are some implementations. Um, with tooling out there. This UFFAF I mentioned is an admixture of XML and JSON. Um, it's now on a, this tool's on GitHub. YAML, I'm going to talk a little about some of the base tools additions, some pull requests that are out there, um, some of the Python changes. And then, you know, FDT has a uh, device tree sources, the device tree compiler, and then um, this UPD, this sort of bespoke thing Intel had, has had its own representation of a source level called BSF, that we're trying to close a little of this dimensionality of variability here with uh, YAML. So again, a lot of ways to do configuration, the last slide, and then in practice, what is the tooling from an end user who's actually maybe um, modifying the source, isn't abstracted by a GUI of the data format? What are these variable data formats? Again, a survey versus an advocacy here. Um, and yeah, here's just a quick overview of this um, UFFAF. If Gahan were here, I'd pull him on the stage and make him uh, talk about his stuff. But really what it is, is it's a workflow such that you can take these um, XML um, representations of desired configuration changes and have tooling to essentially um, edit the binary and change um, your configuration so you don't have to manually go through a user uh, interface UI. So that's kind of uh, some of the execution flow. And the salient part here is it builds upon EDK2 infrastructure because in EDK2 with HII, we have VFR, um, visual forms representation. So HII, the protocol, the binary encoding of IFR is kind of defined by the spec. But the workflow on top, the VFR compiler, is, is a convention, right? It's something the EDK2 project has an example of. A VFR is not a um, UEFI thing, it's a source project thing. So this one builds upon some existing practices with VFR and IFR. And then I mentioned uh, YAML and USF. So one of the explorations here is to say, can we take some of these variant formats, use YAML, define some structure, um, schemas around its usage, start in the open, and then maybe evaluate these other workflows that maybe do their own um, variant of a source um, description and see if we could have um, more common data models um, based on YAML and get some alignment. And so have a couple of examples. The first is um, how does this work in an EDK2 world? So today we have VFR that you compile down to IFR. And so what we're doing here is there's a, a couple phase approach here to say, what would a YAML based workflow look like? So take the VFR, um, generate the YAML, and then have YAML um, source embodiments of the type of configuration information you would have in, um, in, in, in the VFR. And work through um, you know, other configuration idioms, the VPD, PCDs, and others such that if you had um, YAML at the front end, what would the workflow look like? But given this is uh, exploring a new area and you don't want to break things, you don't want to go to teams and say, hey, throw away 20 years of VFR and start doing YAML. Have this as kind of a parallel flow. And so um, this should be uh, links to a, a pull request. And so this work is happening right now on base tools. And one of the cleanup that's happening is the VFR compiler was um, C-based, built on Antler and some other C sort of uh, C infrastructure. So we're going to look at different ways 
to have a source encoding. One of the things that this did is burnt down the original VFR compiler in C and re-implemented in Python, and then adding any new capabilities like these variant um, source embodiments, doing it in um, additions to um, base tools with a YAML base, or excuse me, a Python base tool. And um, other YAML in practice, so I mentioned we have kind of that bespoke um, encoding. BSFs and then UPDs is the is kind of the binary for things like our Intel firmware support package. So we put a tool out in the open called a configuration editor with the idea as follows is it could ingest existing BSF. So if you go to github.com intel fsp, in addition to the fsp binary, we have a .bsf file, which is a source um, encoding of the changes you can do for these UPDs. Ingest that, you can create the YAML. At some point, the YAML may be the primary source on GitHub. But put a tool out there that allows for that. And then having this as kind of an open configuration tool based on Python, you could at some point even do you know, your host firmware configuration, maybe some other target configuration by having this kind of configuration tool. Not some people, you know, actually take this tool, boot into an environment, run Python, do configuration, I'm not advocating you throw away your setup browser and sort of shove this in your ROM and put Python in your ROM and a MicroPython interpreter. But this is tool sort of the offline configuration. That kind of can exemplify this flow. So if we say YAML is a way to represent end user configuration information, having a documentation, you know, starting to collaborate on what those um, schemas might look like in the open on GitHub, and then having a corresponding tool on GitHub that can actually reduce it to practice is one way to uh, sort of have um, some conversations about this space. And boy, I'm going pretty fast. Uh, I'm really going to get you guys out of here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so again, the gist of this here really is as follows, is kind of want to um, look and say, could we take this sort of all these variants we have, JSON, XML, you know, BSFs, others, you know, when we did surveys of even internal tools, there's six other formats, and look to have sort of a common um, source level embodiment of configuration. Again, we were looking at YAML, and then maybe we can get some interoperability, have more common tooling. Imagine this configuration editor, you could have Python objects you plug in to say, if I have some target of configuration, I can hide some of the details of how to map it to the resultant binary configuration blob, but maybe have end users editing you know, YAML as more sort of their source of, sort of representation of it. It's kind of the thinking here. And let's see, oops. Um, and so with that, at 22 minutes, um, any questions, comments, people sleeping? But I can appreciate how something that really uh, works well internally in the company and eventually gets large enough that this is like this could be for other people as well. So I can appreciate where it's coming from. Um, have you one thing I maybe remember from past blogs and blog fests is the is passing a update capsule with the JSON conversion blob up to uh, other services. The idea was something similar to this. From the OS, can we pass a JSON blob that will then eventually have a direct conversion? Any idea what happened to that? It died or I haven't really heard of it recently? Yeah, so in today's world, yeah, when you're in the pre OS and it's sort of a closed environment, you know, like I said, the biggest interoperability you see on things like HI for configuration or option ROMs, right? Where you're pre-OS setup can have that device manager, it publishes forms, and you have a seamless experience. But that's kind of a closed environment. So the intent originally was, hey, you can um, export the forms, the questions, up into the operating system through HII export, and then have your own kind of setup browser experience into the operating system. And then at some point, so 
so people look at it, change their picks, and then be able to affect the change back to the platform, have that being interoperable. I think a few of the challenges are is um, IFR is great, but the questions, everyone's questions is kind of different. So having like a universal browser would imply some more common ontology around what the questions and names are. And then, and then I think the standards group at the time came up with the language neutral, like a fake language. Also the XUFI. Thing. XUFI, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of that stuff didn't click so well. And then imagine the capsule. So OK, I'm going to allow any browser and our OS and in our threat models we consider OS as hostile to throw a bag of config bits back to me. Do I let those in? That's attacker control data. So yeah, the PowerPoint to reality on some of this kind of, yeah, so I was telling Andre, you know, I'm, I'm averse to giving any talks anymore that don't have GitHub links because <laughs> there's not code. I, axiomatically probably doesn't work. Um, but yeah, yeah, and so again, this is really opening up the space. And we looked at YAML because it's kind of like JSON with comments, you know, Kubernetes guys, they say they're really just YAML editors. I'm not implying it's a silver bullet. Languages don't solve problems. You need logical infrastructure and tooling around it and usages and schemas. But it's a place, perhaps, to rally. Um, given it's a superset of JSON, maybe you, we could have YAML as a configuration and it could subset some parts out to the JSON that the Redfish guys need, such that if you think of the end user, and even um, for, for Intel, say we give a tool for graphics configuration, configuration, configuring those spy descriptors for our part, a configuration tool for our reference bias, a configuration tool for FSP. Obviously solve our own problems first, meaning if we say harmonization is good, we should harmonize, right? Yeah. It's disingenuous to tell people to align if you're not. But sort of took the perspective of the workflow of the person who's manipulating these things, objects that may come from different parties, to have a consistent experience, source encoding, align data models, and do something underneath. But there is the real um, palpable business risk of you take 14 variant things and come up with the 15th, right? You know, what's the old saying? Standards are great, everyone should have one. So that's, that's a very um, well-placed uh, comment. Um, don't know. But this is what we're thinking and we're trying to show at least two examples. Because if you say aligning and you have a singleton, it's, it's not a good look. So we're just showing a couple examples here. But this is kind of the, the rationale behind um, why we're doing this work. Um, but yeah, you can um, you can say that's great, but didn't someone just talk about DT? What does this mean with respect to DT becomes a more first class citizen and we start editing DTS files? It's a good question. Things evolve. Sometimes there's creative destruction. Um, so yeah, I'm not implying this is the end state either, but this is kind of what we're thinking. And we'd find a like to work with the community to say, we don't want people to um, expose their intellectual property or workflows, but if you think from an end user perspective, I don't believe there's business value being variant or different of the source encoding of some of your configuration objects and flows. So maybe a line there, but you could have mappers and translators to closed source workflows. That's fine. My, my employer has closed source workflows. I'm not some paragon of openness here. But a line at the top. That's what I'm thinking. No, just to highlight uh, one of the issues we found in trying to do source level translation and doing source level editing is that. Um, VFR does not assign question numbers, uh, doesn't expose the question numbers that actually end up in the IFR. So as a result, if you're doing source load, source level analysis of a thing, trying to map an object that's named after something in the VFR, you can't actually figure out which IFR it's actually attached to. Because there's okay. because like the PCD compiler, the VFR compiler <laughs> will, allow, will auto assign question IDs if you don't get it one. You can actually assign yeah, yeah, you can, but, can. But, but, uh, but a huge amount of reference code doesn't assign it because when they, you know, especially on the server side, when you get uh, several different nodes, they'll use the same exact VFR included, um, and then they expect the compiler to give it a unique number. And then that problem was that that leaves any source attempt to access that same object and try to name that object, you can't actually figure it out from the source site because you don't know what the VFR compiler is actually going to assign to it. Oh, so, yeah, it's the same problem you have with doing PCDs. The PCD numbers don't get assigned till until actual compile time, unless you explicitly specify. And that's a problem, because if you try to use the PCD in the PCD database, you can't actually know which one, and from the source side, what values that actually end up there. 
No, that's, that's great feedback. And in fact, you reminded me of something. I made a promise, and uh, I, I, I need to keep it. So a lot of this work, even my colleague Mike Rothman helped drive, and I should have wrapped his name here. I told him I'd channel him today. So Mike, you speak up here. Oh, just kidding. Um, no, I think part of this and why we want to open this space is we've learned a lot, and if we can kind of sand those rough edges, and then I make the humble advocacy that the host firmware workflow with an EDK2 framework is usually important, but there are other configurable objects, device firmware and others, maybe we can put them in our view. Because our end user, they've got to touch all of them, right? Flipping tools and this or that, or edit text file, ASCII here, XML there. And it may be a Sisyphean you know, task to try to push this rock up, but I think there's enough variant opportunities even with the host firmware adjacencies, or host firmware, even us FSP and EDK2 style host firmware, that I think it's 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 worth the uh, the look, and maybe it drives fixes back. Maybe VFR will say, hey, the, the lift is too high, but maybe drive some changes to the VFR and the Gen PCD. That's cool too. And as long as we're solving problems and moving the ball, moving forward in traffic. Uh, someone told me they're from India. I was talking to this, so they said the key in India is. You just don't stand still. You figure out how to get in traffic. Keep moving. So just keep moving. Uh, moving through traffic. So and don't go backwards. That's it. That's even worse. So. Uh, this actually reminded me of something that Mark tells you of as a device writer. Um, there is a way to place anchors in VFR as a start and end anchor, and then fill in the rest, the IFR, dynamically based on things like features flags, feature yeah. flags coming on the device. Or if you don't know how many ports you need to enumerate uh, on, on your device, then you can dynamically fill it with IFR. And I suspect that will also need to be in some way supported. So then there was a solution there is. Yeah, or maybe. It's a, it's all that to do it. <laughs> or maybe there's what we've learned over the years is some best practices and patterns we should write down that complement the VFR compiler. And Next to this, the Felix um, threat model doc, uh, uh, some busy writers. Yeah, yeah that, that one's a tough one. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I think that's that'd be very valuable too. And in fact, we put a threat model in the appendix of our secure coding EDK2 doc, and we put a few things in there like boot guard and others, and we'd be happy to excise them and point to an EF Intel property, but have generic threat model concepts in one place and point to the the Qualcomm M shields and the AMD PSP verified boot collaterals, such that again, the end users, this stuff's complicated. Man. Just, just the generic assurance stuff on EDK style bias and then the variant hardware protections. So yeah, I think documentation on the VFR threat models be good things. And yeah, it's good feedback uh, from this forum too. On, that's what I got. Oops. On all point, another area we found in doing runtime uh, using a, a, a HII is PCD dynamic PCDs, which are which control in callbacks that control the format of the IFR. So if you runtime runtime do not have access to the PCD database, and so as a result, they cannot properly understand what's going on in the callback. They can't to, to know should I show it or not show it. Um, we basically had to outlaw runtime PCD usage in certain you know, for patching because there was no way for a, a tool to know if that should be present or not present. Yeah, no, I think that's another use case. And if you dig into the UFFAF, I think there's some left, right-handed ways it's going after it. And yeah, I think these are the type of things that you sort of learn, learn by experience. And it's disingenuous to think you have infrastructure that doesn't need to evolve or change at time. There's some radical changes, maybe at the top. You say, hey, that's, the, the trip's too, too, too expensive. But maybe smaller things in the middle. Yeah. So you presented the YAML as the VFR replacement, YAML for the speed configuration, and YAML for your set configurations. So today, are those three different formats, or is it the same YAML format? It's the same format, and I think we journaled the, the variants in the USF spec on GitHub. Yeah, but, um, so I think in general, of course, oh, I appreciate the effort, that's, that's probably not. I think uh, one of the issues with the 
shell, there are like two types of configuration. The build time configuration, what for, for, and then the uh, run time configuration, maybe set of base configuration. And those are overlapping sense because what, what is uh, you know, user configuration for, for some is, uh, is uh, just build time configuration for others, depending on the like business you requirements or yeah, design. So today, uh, each infrastructure is built in such a manner that this IFR question is like a primary entity. It's uh, today even sometimes like it's very typical, it's very convenient during silica implementation to have like two hundred setup controls to go test individual features, but then for that users of course not two hundred, but two thousand sometimes. Right, I was gonna say you had a you're missing yeah. a zero or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the end user it, it's it's ridiculous. But today the situation is such so much is built around, even you show the test tool, it's a configuration tool. It's heavily based on IFR. So even if you don't need control, you just go hide it, you can't remove it. So maybe I think if you're talking about designing new configuration infrastructure, that should be like a primary focus. The configuration mode should be like, set of control should, should be an optional addition or attachment on top of configuration mode. And in K2, we have PCDs, which is pure configuration mode. But it's, uh, like GTA, I mean, it's somewhat aligned with HII, but uh, I think it's not very instrumental. Right, right. No, and, and, and some of it's historical fact. I think yeah, yeah, HII yeah. was but framework. Not blame and, anybody else kind of part of it, yeah. No, no, yeah, no, it's not a blame. It's a, you know, on the arc of the archaeological layers of some of this, right? And that's the thing I realized working on a project for so long. Like, when you take look at a new project from the outside, you think there was some prime architect Brooks that designed everything from the bottoms up and it's this goal. And then when you work on a project over many years, you realize arbitrary, some maybe some ill-conceived thoughts, you patch it, you add something else. And someone coming in new will say, wow, this was some grand envisioned singleton. And it's like, no, it's like pieces. <laughs> so yeah. And then everyone's using those mashed pieces. So you say, let's change how they're mashed. And they say, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's kind of the dialogue we want going, and you know, you can find the community forums, wrap in USF or turn back on UCST. I don't really care on our mailing list, but I want to have that kind of discussion with folks because, again, really, I want to, my view is bringing all these variant usages and find some alignment points, and then if we have to retread specific frameworks embodiments. You know, maybe it's disingenuous to say we have a common configuration blob. I drop in U boot, EDK2 core boot, and mega boot. <laughs> you guys might have already copyrighted that, so I don't know. Um, you know, maybe that's a mile too far too, because there's business reasons you wouldn't. But the technology wouldn't prohibit it. It's defined enough. It's decoupled enough. That that's possible. But take some of the first class usages and maybe tighten them up. You know, again, VFR is a had a good, that's had a great run, and I think this will be an evolutionary approach for EDK um, framework for this audience. That's kind of the dialogue I wanted to, want to have today. Um, but yeah, I thought the FTT stuff was pretty refreshing, and in fact, next week um, there's going to be some folks at OCP talking about another part of USF, the universal payload, and its use of FTT, and so. Um, I think it's good stuff, right? Open the box, take a look. Um, challenge assumptions, as Andre noted with the new um, microarchitecture SQ supported. Sometimes you have to dust stuff off and uh, relook at it. So, and I guess my other closing thought is, um, you know, take business problems. Like, I heard today or yesterday, the government guys want us to be able to replace things. You know, maybe how we partition our code such that it's more serviceable. Could we have generic EFI, FE as distinct from our platform in silicon, such that each is separately more serviceable? I think we should take a look. And if that has business promise, what are the technology inhibitors to doing something like that? I think it's, it's timely, right? Because you know, I want to do things that have business relevance and values. The old saying I was once told was, if you're working on something the business guys don't care about, it's called a hobby. <laughs> Even in the good times, getting paid for the hobby was tough. In the tough times, I suspect I know your employment status if you're just working on hobbies. So, you know, solve a business problem. That's, that's, that's all I got today.
Uh, any more questions or people? Conference fatigue? Well, so Vincent, I just wanted to mention, so <coughs> there's two ways to use JSON, right? The, the first way is just, or sorry, YAML. The, the first way is just kind of JSON with comments, right? The second way is uh, white space becomes scope uh, uh, de definitions, right? So would we want to maybe standardize more of the former versus the latter, right? It, it, it's very kind of like, like the syntax is just almost completely different, depending on which one you're doing. Yeah, no, I think that should definitely be within scope here. And, and now I have a new comment that's going to ring in my ear, the 15th one. It's like every time I work at something, oh, the dude said you're doing the 15th one. It's a comment. <laughs> Thanks very much, Vincent. That uh, was very thought-provoking as well. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, they, I think this was an excellent discussion over the last three days. And it was uh, very positive. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming and participating with us. That, this has been terrific. And for those who had to leave a little early or whatever, I pass that along to them uh, that we really appreciate your efforts here.